Thank you, Kai. Good morning uh, to all. Um, thanks to the Ministry of Economic Affairs, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Confederation of Finnish Industry for bringing me back to Helsinki, as the Under Secretary of State said. Ten years ago, I was here to promote private enforcement, uh, private enforcement of the competition rules. And the example I gave at the time was the, uh, the asphalt cartel. Um, and as it happened to be, only a couple of weeks ago, the Court of Justice gave its uh, judgment on private enforcement in the uh, Sanska case. So you see, it was about time for me to be back and, um, and start a new reason for coming to Helsinki and coming back. Hopefully, uh, I don't have to wait until 29 uh, to be back. Um, but in any case, happy to be here. Thank you also for allowing me to, to speak English. My Finnish is as cold as the weather outside. It's, uh, there's not that much going on in my Finnish. Um, so thanks for allowing me to, uh, to speak our common language. Um, when the organizers of the uh, event gave me this title, then I thought, yeah, sure, what can we do about trade distorting subsidies by third states? It's an issue of sovereignty. It's an issue of sovereignty both here and abroad. Subsidies is a measure, a possibility for states to do industrial policy. And we have decided when we are, were creating the internal market within the European Union, that it was necessary to have subsidies controlled so that the member states of the European Union could not just freely choose their winners, because that is what state aid is about. You decide who is going to win on your market, because you are financially supporting somebody, maybe a startup, but it could also be a company that is ailing and that you believe, for other reasons than competition, need to be supported. Within the European Union, we decided in the exercise of our sovereignty together that you cannot freely, as a member state, spend the money as you wish. State aid control doesn't mean that you cannot give state aid any longer. Not at all. But it means that you have to orient the state aid towards a good cause. So there is a, a difference to be made, a distinction between good aid and bad aid. And because we want to avoid that the member states with the deepest pockets can choose their winners on the internal market, we came with state aid control. The idea being one of a level playing field. Of course, you know all of this. But it's good to keep this in mind when we move it to the next level, to the global level, where again, we have to do in our trade relations with other sovereign states, with other sovereign states that are investing here. And it is an investment that usually we are welcoming. Investments within the European Union by one member state in another are welcome. Investments by third states, in principle, are welcome. We are an open economy, and that is something that we should, as a principle, cherish, without being naive in that regard. And that is where the question comes in. What if subsidies are threatening the level playing field? How can we reestablish the level playing field, whilst being an open economy. That is the challenge. That is what we need to talk about. Okay, the easiest is that as in the European Union, you create common rules. So as we have done already in the 50s when we started the uh, European Economic Community with state aid rules, we create one internal market with common competition and state aid rules. If you are increasing global trade, you need global rules to organize the global trade. 
Well, we have global rules on subsidies, namely the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. I don't know whether you have done already the exercise of reading that agreement. Um, not necessarily the most fantastic reading, uh, both as to its formulation, but particularly as to its content. It was apparently very difficult to come to those global rules on subsidy control, which is obvious because subsidy control is nothing more, nothing less than telling the countries of the WTO how they should give subsidies to their, member, to their companies. Not an easy task. The ASCM agreement is insufficient, clearly insufficient, for a number of reasons. First of all, this agreement is only governing the trade in goods. Trade in goods is an important part of the global trade, but clearly there is a growing need to have rules on trade in services. You have in the GATS one sentence on subsidies that is not useful at all. So we have in the ASCM only rules on subsidies to goods. There are only few prohibitions in there, in the ASCM, few, few prohibitions on subsidies. And if you want to invoke as a WTO member that another member has violated those prohibitions, you need to show injury and if you have been able to show injury, then you will not have that injury compensated, but then the worst that can happen to the violating WTO member is that they have to stop subsidizing. In the Airbus Boeing, it took the WTO almost 15 years to come to any conclusion on that. For industry, 15 years, I mean, that's a hell of a time. I tried to remember how Helsinki looks like 10, 10 years ago. I remember the church here but the, and the harbor because I got lost there 10 years ago. But 15 years? If you have to fight an illegal subsidy that is trying to destroy your business and only 15 years later that subsidy will have to be recalled, that's not necessarily useful. The beginning, even, of that whole process is transparency. WTO members have to be transparent on the subsidies they are giving to goods. Last year, miraculously, more than half of the WTO members have not given any subsidy to goods. At least, they didn't report any. So no subsidy was being given. The union is transparent. We have a website on which the whole world can see what subsidies are being given. And our member states dutifully reported to the WTO. But 55% of the WTO members has not given any subsidy whatsoever. Sanction for not reporting? Nil. None. None whatsoever. You can hear that I'm not too excited about this agreement. So, we found partners in crime. Well, crime, I think it's not a crime to improve the WTO rules. And we have found the Americans and the Japanese, we have found in them allies to modify the WTO rules. We want to strengthen the transparency rules. We want to increase the number of prohibitions. And we want to have a better enforcement system. I would love to add also services, 
but it needs three to tango this time. So if we can get a deal with these three on better transparency, more prohibitions, and stronger enforcement of the WTO rules, that's already a big step ahead, a big step that we will take in the right directions. We are discussing with the Americans and the Japanese almost on a weekly basis. And once we have agreed amongst the three of us, uh, we will then take up with the other WTO membership to see what is feasible. It's not for tomorrow that we will change the WTO rules. As it is not for tomorrow to amend the WTO rules, we need to think of alternatives. We don't leave the WTO route aside. It's an important issue. It's important to have global rules governing global trade. But since that can take a while, we have to think about alternatives. One of those alternatives is what we do in the G7, G20. In G7, G20, we are mainly focusing on sectors. Sectors where we believe that subsidies to trade are unleveling the playing field. And the one on which we have agreed within G20 is steel. There is in steel overcapacity, and still there are countries subsidizing steel industry. You think of China? Look at our website of the subsidies that are given in the European Union to steel. We may look at China. We have to look at China. Let's look at the European Union as well. And let's look at the US. There is, for the moment, lots of subsidies being given to steel while there is an overcapacity. The members of the G20 have agreed to monitor the subsidization. That active monitoring process, and the OECD will take up that role, that active monitoring process will allow us to go a step further than the WTO, which is very much a reactive forum. You need to tell the WTO what the transparency is, uh, tell them what your subsidies are. Transparency is, for the WTO, they are on the receiving end. They are not asking actively for transparency, so they are on the receiving end. You need to have a complaint in order to bring a case to the WTO. So it's not that there is an enforcement model within the WTO actively bringing cases. In this global forum on steel excess capacity, there will be an active monitoring taking place. That's a new step limited to the steel sector, but where we will come in to check more actively where subsidies are hindering the trade. Within the OECD, we are regularly talking subsidies. Shipbuilding, for example. Or, as we will do in the competition committee in June, uh, competitive neutrality in order to avoid, in particular, that the private sector and the public sector and those in between, in particular, the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises, how they are together in a trade environment, but they should not be treated differently. There should be neutrality into the way that they are being treated. Subsidies comes into that discussion, obviously, and we will discuss that in June. We are talking at the OECD, for those of you who have been at the OECD, that is what's mainly happening. And you may also come there to a recommendation from the Council. Let's see whether also on competitive neutrality we will get there. I've also put an additional 
bullet here on an initiative, and I see two members who have been attending the meeting last time for Finland. We have created uh, in the Commission the International Subsidy Policy Group. Because we were talking to our trade colleagues, as we regularly do on these issues, as you can imagine, uh, the foreign subsidies is mainly a trade issue, but also the people from COMP, from DG Competition, tend to take an interest. Some will say you take an interest in everything. But here is clearly also from our subsidy side, there is something to be said. We found out that the colleagues in the member states of trade and state aid were not necessarily talking to each other. We may be sometimes saying when it, and I will talk in a minute about FTA rules, our, uh, our free trade agreements in which we have subsidy rules. Colleagues from a state aid angle are looking at these FTA rules very differently than colleagues from a trade angle do it. So you need to have both in a room together looking at those rules in order to come to a balanced outcome that is profitable for the member states as a whole. And that is why we have created this international uh, subsidy policy group. We have been meeting two times now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, discussing amongst others the trilateral on the WTO reform, discussing FTAs, um, and I'm inviting you now already to come to Brussels in June for our third meeting of the uh, International Subsidy Policy Group, where we will discuss, well, there are a few current issues of international subsidies that we may want to discuss with both trade and state aid colleagues. So we have alternatives in the, at the multilateral level, um, alternatives like the, uh, sorry, if this makes a bit of noise, um, particularly around the G20. That in itself is also not sufficient to create the level playing field that we want to achieve. In fact, as I said, our objective is to maintain openness of our industry, of our trade, without being naive and creating that level playing field. We have, next to the multilateral, we have some efforts also at bilateral level, and that is where the FTAs I was just referring to are coming in. In our free trade agreements with third states, we are systematically bringing in subsidy rules that are WTO plus. More transparency, more prohibitions, and a better enforcement system. And yes, in those FTAs, we try also to widen the subsidy rules to services. And if you check out the FTA with Japan, you will notice that in the FTA with Japan, we have very clear WTO plus rules. Beyond the FTAs, we also with other third states or future third states, underlining the importance of state aid. Take Switzerland. With Switzerland, we have had a number of agreements allowing access to our market. The 1972 free trade agreement with Switzerland allows for access to our market. It has a state aid provision, which is very difficult to enforce, so we have agreed with the Swiss in the autumn of last year to create an institutional framework agreement with stricter state aid rules. 
In order to have that level playing field, you allow Swiss companies to come on the European market, so they have to play by the European rules. That is why we have in the International Framework Agreement, draft for the moment, we have strict state aid rules. For those of you who read the 500 pages withdrawal agreement with the UK, you may have noticed that there are 10 pages on state aid control. If you want to continue having access to the EU market, you need to respect the EU rules on state aid. The withdrawal agreement, whether or not it will enter into force, as you know, that's not in our hands for the moment. But it is an indication of Europe being more proud of the way it is organizing its internal market. And at the same time, not being naive. Open, you can access our market, but not naive, you have to respect state aid rules. We have those in agreements, that bilateral action, that is the hard law, but we are also, via soft means, trying to export our state aid rules. Because we believe that subsidy control is useful for any state. For example, we are discussing with the Chinese regularly our state aid control and what is called in Chinese, but then translated, the fair competition review. So the Chinese have since 2016 have started a total uh, overhaul of legislation, rules that are in place to check whether they are in line with the fair competition review standards. Subsidies is part of that. And we are assisting our Chinese colleagues in that fair competition review. We are assisting them by going over there and train Chinese officials, but also inviting Chinese officials to come to Europe and see how state aid rules are being applied over here and what the benefit can be of that for an economy. And we hope that those bilateral efforts over time will bring abroad this philosophy of distinguishing good and bad aid and having a stricter control of subsidies. You may say that also that is a long-term initiative that doesn't make it less valuable, but it means that we may have to do something in the shorter term. And that is where the unilateral alternatives come in. Multilateral, very important to modify the WTO rules, but you need all the WTO partners. Bilateral, a nice intermediate solution to pave the way towards a multilateral outcome, but for a bilateral, you need a partner to agree. Unilateral is what we do on our own. And what can we do on our own to face these foreign subsidies that are threatening the level playing field? One obvious choice would be to change our state aid rules domestically. Some are saying that that is what we need to do. We need to get a bit more relaxed on the state aid rules that we are having, saying that we apply them far too strictly. Looking at the billions of state aid that are spent in Europe, I don't think that our state aid rules are overly strict. I think that there are good reasons to have those state aid rules within the European Union. The reasons that we had back in the 50s in order to create a level playing field within the European Union to have those state aid rules are still valid today. It cannot be that 
particular member states that have the money available are by subsidizing their companies should be able to choose the winners within the European internal market. We have all interest in maintaining the state aid rules as they are. And when we were openly discussing this point at one of the first meetings of the International Subsidy Policy Group, it came as a relief, but as a comfort at the same time, to see that member states are on that same, of that same opinion. That we have no reason to modify our state aid rules. What else can we do? There is, of course, the possibility to bring anti-subsidy or anti-dumping measures. For that, as I said, if you do that unilaterally, also then you need to be able to show injury. And at the first, in the first place, you need to be able to know that there is foreign subsidization that is falsifying the level playing field, which is not very easy. Uh, we have taken a case for, uh, against Pirelli that got uh, its uh, financing uh, from China. But it is very hard to get information on foreign subsidization. And my, my last slide, I'll come to that, will be exactly about that. Um, because after all the actions that the European Union is taking, I will spend my last slides on how you can help us facing uh, foreign subsidization. So that's a mean that we have already at our disposal. There is a new instrument in town, adopted uh, earlier this month, and that is the foreign direct investment control. Foreign direct investment control is a rule that allows the member states to block foreign investment if that foreign investment would be considered to be threatening national security or the public order. So all member states are now invited to introduce legislation allowing for that kind of investment control, foreign investment control, and blocking foreign investment if it is considered to be threatening national security or the public order. We are mainly thinking here about foreign investment into sensitive technology and critical infrastructure. Looking at because everybody is talking about China, looking at the Chinese investments in 2018 within the European Union, more than 80% of those Chinese investments would fall within the category of critical infrastructure and sensitive technology, and would thus fall within the possibility for member states to stop such an investment. It's a possibility, a thing that nobody wants to block foreign investment in Europe. Well, maybe one or two, but not that many. Eh? I think that everybody is acknowledging the importance of foreign investment for a region like ours. The only thing is that we should not accept whatever foreign investment. Hence, this control mechanism that member states are invited to introduce into their national legislation. But there is a second element to it. One is this foreign investment control, and you will find in the regulation on foreign direct investment control that one of the elements that could be checked by the member state is whether a third state gets controlled through financing. So here comes the element of third state financing in. There is another element to this, and that is namely in case of public tenders, that our European companies that are faced with the state aid rules 
which we just qualified as being appropriate, are faced with competition in a public tender from a foreign company that is receiving subsidies from its state. So a third state company with third state financing enters on our market with a subsidized bid, therefore a lower bid than a European company. There is for the moment within Europe no possibility to go against this foreign offer. The Commission made a proposal to counter these unlevel playing field measures. To counter that by increasing the foreign offer fictitiously. That is a proposal that we have made in 2012, renewed in 2016, still pending before Council and Parliament, the International Procurement Initiative. The latest we heard from European Council is that the heads of state and government are stimulating the institution to make some progress on the adoption of the IPI. I think that would be a good case uh, if we can get the IPI adopted because it will lead to some more of a re reciprocity, if I can uh, call it like that. Reciprocity in the trading conditions. We also are about to adopt a unilateral measure in the airline industry where hindrance of the level playing field in the airline industry by foreign subsidization can be countered after investigation by the Commission. Also, that is a unilateral measure that is about to be adopted. And we have, as a final measure, we have also stimulated what we call important projects of common European interest, where a number of member states can come together, tens of also companies, under a scheme to stimulate an industry that is of particular importance for the European economy. That one that we have adopted was on microelectronics, important indeed, particularly for uh, the uh, e-mobility. And hopefully we will soon have also an IPCI on batteries, because also there we need to stimulate, as uh, was just mentioned, we need to stimulate the European economy on that particular field. So we, we are taking internally those measures in order to create an as level playing field as possible by attacking or counterweighting foreign subsidies. What is still missing is of course that we would need to improve the conditions of investment abroad. If we talk about reciprocity, it is not a good idea to copy here what is going wrong abroad. If we are complaining that abroad it is difficult for European companies to have access to a market because there is forced um, technology uh, licensing, that they forced technology licensing that they are into, for example. If then you claim reciprocity, I hope you don't mean by, by saying that, that we need to have the same here in Europe. Reciprocity, in that respect, means that we need to convince the other side of changing its rules to open up their markets for European investments. Which, by the way, European investments abroad are not too bad either. I mean, figures on European investment in China show that it's still an interesting place to invest into. But we are negotiating for the moment with China an investment agreement, which is important in order to create that investment environment 
into China that has the level playing field that we are looking for. So different measures are being taken, multilaterally, bilaterally, unilaterally, in order to face the challenges that foreign subsidies are posing to us. Is that sufficient? Probably not. The European Commission earlier this month issued a notice on relations between the EU and China. And we have identified, well, not identified, at least for the moment we have acknowledged that in the tools that are at our disposal to face the challenges posed by foreign subsidization, there may be gaps. And we have invited the European Council, who readily took up the invitation, uh, to allow us, by the end of this year, to identify how we can fill the remaining gaps. Remaining gaps in how Europe can protect itself against undue foreign subsidization. So the issue is on the agenda. That is very clear. And uh, we will, within the Commission, if we need to reach the end of 19 with um, a document on how to fill the gaps, we need to identify the gaps and then think of measures. So it promises being a busy summer again. But as I said, I want to finish with also a call towards you. You can help us in identifying the gaps in the European tools. You can help us in facing the challenges posed by foreign subsidization. And you can do that by informing the European Commission or your member state, as you see fit, informing about subsidies, foreign subsidies, that you are aware of. As I said, according to the WTO, there is hardly any foreign subsidization in this world. We know that there is foreign subsidization, but we need to get evidence of that. And therefore, if you are aware of foreign subsidization that is falsifying the level playing field, the level playing field on the global trade, then please inform either your member state or directly the Commission for us to see whether with the unilateral means that are at our disposal, and as I just explained, a growing toolbox of unilateral means, that we can maybe improve them or use them. And this information may also help us in our bilateral contacts, because it will tell us about specific third states where exactly the sour points are. And ultimately, it will help us to identify for the multilateral discussions which subsidies are the most important ones that we have to try to tackle. So it is a job for the European Commission to face the uh, foreign subsidization, but not only for the European Commission. If the question is asked, what can we do about trade distorting subsidies? It's a task also for the member states, sorry, and it's a task for industry. So we're in this together. And if I may, Ilka, I'm inviting myself to come back and take stock, what shall we say, in a couple of years, come back to Helsinki, take stock of where we are and whether today's situation, where we, we are very much aware of the challenges that we are facing, but we have been able to tackle that while maintaining the open economy that we cherish. So, see you in a couple of years, back in Helsinki. Thanks. Thank you very much, Eddie. I think we'll, we'll take up you on, on your offer to come back to Helsinki, and there's a task for every one of us to, to really um, to come up with, uh, with evidence so that we can help the European Commission to, to, to help us, basically.
So we now still have some time for, for questions and answers. So both to, to Petri and to Eddie on, on their presentations or any other issue that like, you would like to ask them at this point. We will after that continue and finish with, uh, with other um, presentations. So may I ask if anybody has questions or comments and, and please wait until you get the microphone so that our friends who are looking at the streaming can also hear your, your questions. So Taneli Lahti, Finnish Confederation of uh, Employers. Mic for Taneli. Thank you very much. My name is Taneli Lahti from the Confederation of uh, Finnish Industries. Um, thank you very much for a very clear presentation. I think it is it, it is it comes timely and it is a very topical issue, of course, uh, that is being discussed in, in, in Finland as well as in other parts of Europe. Uh, um, the, um, I think it was encouraging to see uh, and, and, and hear and how the European Commission is, is addressing the challenge on our behalf. And I think, and I think it is a fair question also to ask um, the industry and business and to, to do its share and, uh, and, and come up with information. And when we, um, and when our com uh, companies compete in the global market, I mean they face, of course, uh, situations and where where the where there are strong suspicions that the competition is not fair or, or that the level or that the playing or that the field is uh, is, is not level um, the um, but then I, on on uh, on this in information um, gathering I think it would be quite helpful I and mean, if, if, if you if you could a bit more specific on what kind of information you would need um, what the channels for, for, for passing that information would be, and then also and how companies providing that information will be protected and from, from, uh, from possible consequences on those global markets, because we know that, uh, that, uh, that these issues are obviously extremely sensitive, uh, and the governments or authorities that we are dealing with might not be so pleased when, when, uh, when, uh, when, uh, when they are being put to, put to challenge. Thanks. Thank you very much, Taneli. Are there any other questions at this point? So please, Kari. Thank you. My name is Kari Hietanen, Vertical Corporation. Uh, the, the topic today was titled uh, State uh, Subsidies to Distort Trade. And I can endorse that. I think we can all here endorse that. And I, when you talked about the multilateral efforts, uh, the US, Japan, the EU, I think, uh, there's probably a chance to get an overall generic uh, agreement. But when you go outside this group to the uh, WTO, WTO uh, 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 peers, uh, I'm just thinking it might be a challenging job. Uh, I think the philosophy we are representing here is not shared uh, in the same way. Uh, and, and there are many countries which think that actually the aid is not distorting, it's changing the distortion to their benefit. So, and, and you uh, told about some uh, cooperation examples and, and so on, but how much do we know of the preparedness of many countries which have different approach to engage in realistic, in concrete discussions and really change the, 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 the platform for trade? All right, let's take these two, two questions at, at first and then and we'll continue. So, Eddie, I guess that these were yeah. both mainly to you. Okay, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll, take, them, I'll take them in, uh, in that order. I, I appreciate that indeed giving information about foreign subsidization is sensitive. There may be a fear of retaliation on the side of the uh, third country. Um, first of all, what information are we looking at? It's all information that can assist us in the, particularly in the unilateral measures that I have been naming. So it's the anti-dumping, anti-subsidy uh, measures that we could take. It's important to also look at what uh, the regulation on uh, airlines uh, is now going to put in place and the investigation possibility of the Commission there. And if the IPI comes into force, also there there is an investigation possibility for the Commission um, into foreign subsidization, so assisting that would also be helpful. We're looking not only at direct subsidization, obviously, also indirect subsidization, 
is looked at. Indirect subsidization, look at the kind of cases that we have in the European Union, for example, through the fiscal regime, or by having beneficial access to ground, to electricity, what have you, or having loans at a lower rate. So whatever economic <coughs> benefits that the state is given on a selective basis to certain companies, that is what we would call measures that are creating an unlevel playing field. So it's very broad, and it's not only at the national level, also at regional level, or even local. Whatever that is disturbing the level playing field. So the range is very broad. The idea is, of course, not that we would go then to the third state and say, company X has claimed that. I'm making this call not only in Finland, I'm also making the call wider in the European Union, to all European industry, in order to allow us to aggregate the information. And it's that aggregated information that anonymizes the input. Because of that you can be very sure. The source of the information we will keep confidential. I can sign that here, that confidentiality. I don't know whether that helps you. I can refer to the tradition that we have definitely in DG competition and I assume also in DG trade. So the Commission has a good reputation in keeping information confidential. So yes, we will keep the information confidential. But if you don't want to give it directly to the Commission, then you can also go through your member state. So that is why I, I offered the two possibilities. If you don't want to send it electronically, then you can come and give it by hand. So all means are, in, are relevant, and they are for us the basis of our investigations that we can take in anti-subsidy, in uh, anti-dumping, in the airline industry, and shortly in the IPI. So, I hope that helps um, for, sending, for sending information. I don't know whether, on that point, you want to add something? Well, this is actually a very good, I think, spot on that you said, and I think the notion of state is very broad. There are very broad, broad spectrum of shades of grey when we are talking about state aids. Obviously, the conventional direct loans, grants, uh, guarantees are uh, obviously something which are easily recognized and regulated. But then there's other sort of a indirect sort of a uh, types of uh, state aids that are there through uh, zoning and landing, through infrastructure, through tax, tax benefits uh, and, and many others. And, and maybe the third and most difficult is then through ownership. Direct ownership or our state control. I mean, state control enterprises may settle for less profit. They they get sort of a govern, governance which is not necessarily as sort of a, a transparent as we uh, sort of a custom in the West. And how to sort of a, then you know differentiate and identify all those levels of of direct and, and specific indirect subsidies and how to sort of a, raise the cases. I think is is very difficult task. But of course, I think it's most important that we receive the information, not only on, on the conventional aids, but also the ones that are distorting competition from, through indirect measures, and I think that then helps us to understand the situation and the play field and its uh, sort of a levelness, and secondly, the device policies, be those multilateral or unilateral. <coughs> Let me just also confirm what Eddie was saying about the confidentiality and how we operate. We have a long tradition of working with companies and, and with the European Commission and and, and this is something which we are very aware of that this kind of information is such that companies very often do not want it to be known that this information comes from them. So whichever methodology you choose, um, you, can, you don't need to wait two or three years before Eddie comes back to Helsinki the next time. Um, meetings can be arranged in, in Brussels, you can direct the, uh, you can give the information to us, we will, we will make sure that the name of the company is not being revealed. We can, 
work then with the European Commission. There's a number of ways of, of achieving this, and I think that confidentiality will not be a problem in the way that, that we are very conscious of, of risks which are related to it. Um, there was another question yes, from Karin Hirvan as well on the WTO. Yeah, very pertinent, of course. Um, in the WTO, you have a number of partners that you will need to convince <coughs> in order to modify the uh, agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. That's true. Um, at the same time, uh, if you can have an agreement with the EU, America and Japan, you are bringing together already three important economies that may agree on how subsidization should look like. The whole negotiation technique is then for the colleagues of trade, and I trust that uh, they will do a good job on that. Uh, Commissioner Malmström is very versatile in that respect. So the, uh, there are bilateral discussions going on with other partners, important partners. And you may consider also, if, you, if it is not possible to modify the ASCM agreement, you could consider having an agreement between a number of WTO members. And so, as I said, we have in our bilateral the WTO plus. Why not having an agreement with 2030 states? So not the multilateral framework of the WTO, but you could have a plurilateral. And in fact, what the G20 Global Forum on Steel Excess Capacity is doing is exactly that. And we are bringing together those steel producing companies and monitoring their subsidization. So it is on the route towards changing the WTO rules that you may find more and more partners to join you. And you could, in the interim, conclude already agreement between those. The more member states of the WTO that we can convince of the benefits of state aid control, mm. the better. But you're absolutely right. Once we have agreed, the three of us, we are not even halfway. We need to continue the bilateral talks with other important, important economic actors. Very good. Please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for all of you for a very, very enlightening and, and uh, timely presentation. This is really a topic that, that I am very happy to, to discuss with all of you and, and, and participate at the debate. I'm not so much concerned about the, 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 the anti-subsidy rules of, of EU at all. I'm, I mean, I'm, I take up a case from steel which I know best. And, and in steel we have had absolutely no difficulties in the confidentiality issue. And we have had many anti-dumping cases. We have had no difficulties in the overall regulation that we have in place. But we have one problem, and I would like to ask your, your advice on this one. And the problem is, is namely this. When we look at the steel itself in China and in EU, we can clearly see that there are subsidies in China, and these subsidies are well recognized and well, well identified. And if you compare the Chinese steel industry, the European steel industry, you can, you can easily say that, okay, China, there is subsidized and whatever, whatever distorted competition against the, the European steel industry. And on that basis, it would be very easy to conclude that, okay, we have to have anti-dumping case or we have to have some sort of a, a countermeasure in place. But the problem arises in the fact that our value chains are very, very much interlinked. Very many industries also here, present in here in this, in this, this uh, event, they use steel. They are the users of the steel. And from the user's point of view, actually the subsidized, cheap Chinese steel is very, very, very beneficial. And there lies, I think, the biggest problem in Europe at the moment in terms of all of these, these things. Not in the regulation, not in the law. They are very good. They are probably the best in the world, I would say. Not in the confidentiality, because because what I can confirm everybody, there is no problem in confidentiality. None of the information that the steel industry has given to the Commission has leaked. But this problem of having several diverging interests within Europe is a big, big problem, and I don't see really a good solution on this one, because I come from the Finnish technology industries, and in, as in our membership we have both the users and the producers. And obviously we would like to be in a place to, to serve and, and provide 
shelter and provide uh, solutions for all of them. So this is one, th one thing that I would like to com you to comment if possible. Thank you. Easy question. Easy question. Yeah, um, I, uh, I think it is absolutely right that the interests within the European Union, and that's from one producer to the next, but also from one member state to the next, is very different. The fact that the IPI regulation uh, is not yet adopted after seven years running around in Brussels, there's a good reason for that. Um, I think that the FDI regulation, by giving the power of the FDI control to the member states, is maybe part of the solution right now. The answer now is to give, to coordinate actions taken at member state level. Um, and that is exactly what the FDI regulation uh, is doing. Mind you, already for the moment, quite a number of member states have the possibility to stop foreign direct investment. And so there are member states already today with FDI control, and still it is not that often used. I mean, one thing is that we are all aware of the challenges that are posed by uh, foreign subsidization. But I also, when I meet European industry, I, I often uh, get direct witnesses of those benefiting. Benefiting directly from foreign subsidization, or as you just mentioned, indirectly. So it, uh, it will be a tough job to, uh, to find the right balance there. And, but I think that it fits within that the dialogue between the openness that we need to maintain, as I said, nobody wants to stop the foreign investment, but we may want at least to enable the member states to, uh, to take those measures that can, uh, that can allow European industry to have on a level playing field some competition in Europe and abroad. And it's that latter element that is probably one of the most challenging. But I, uh, I will not say you're wrong. <laughs>